Hey guys, welcome back to the Orthodox Universalist channel. Before we get started, I just want to say two things. First, thank you. As of this month, the channel has been up for one year and it's grown to a little over 1,400 subscribers. It's been an absolute blast to host the channel, but the very best part has been to share it with all of you. For this reason, I'm making it a personal goal going into this second year to engage more directly with your thoughts and questions, whether you're a skeptic of the whole Christianity thing or whether you believe universalism is heresy, or whether we agree on a lot of the issues discussed on the channel, I'd love to know what you're thinking about and bring topics related to your interests to the channel. No topic is off the table, so let me know what you would like to hear about. To submit a question or a topic for suggestion, shoot me an email using the address in the description of this video. Thanks again for all of your support over this first year. With all that said, Let's get started. When people consider the idea of Christian universalism, the most common definition that comes to mind is that it's a belief that all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter what you do or who you are or where you are or what you believe. Ultimately, Jesus is going to save everybody anyway, so don't sweat the small stuff. In fact, don't even sweat the big stuff. In the end, everybody gets to heaven, so we should stop worrying so much about the means, because the end is going to be the same regardless. But truly biblical Christianity of any variety, including Christian universalism, rejects this notion. Even a cursory reading of the Bible simply dismantles any credibility to the idea that all roads are equal or good. Consider a few scriptures that make this clear. In Deuteronomy 30, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel and says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live. But if your heart turns away, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. And in Proverbs 11:19, we see this idea again when we read, Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. The Apostle Paul also emphasizes this point in Romans 2. God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. But perhaps most famously, Jesus explains this point in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter by the narrow gate, he says, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Outside of Scripture, this contrast of a way leading to life versus a way leading to death has always been appreciated by the Church. Even in the Didache, for example, which is possibly the oldest extra-biblical Christian treatise that we have, the text begins by declaring, There are two ways, one of life and one of death. Any truly biblical form of Christian universalism would line up completely with all this, affirming that not every path leads to paradise. In fact, it goes further than this and affirms that there are only two paths to choose from, the way of life, which is to follow Christ, and the way of death, which is to do anything else. There are no other options. This has nothing to do with being judgmental, it's actually just logical. People can't experience unity with Christ and the joys of the kingdom so long as they reject Christ and reject his kingdom. Don't get me wrong, I don't mean they are punished for rejecting Christ even if that's the case. What I mean is much simpler than that. For example, 
I've had people ask me, so you think that all people will eventually end up in heaven even if they reject Christ? But my answer is always no. Life is gained when life is sought. Otherwise, it will always remain elusive. I want to try to break this down even more so it becomes crystal clear. I know it'll probably seem like I'm spending a lot of time on a very basic idea, but I think it's so basic that we often overlook the implications of it. When people talk about the kingdom of heaven, they imagine it as a future paradise that will be gained through faith in Christ. But it is also something we participate in entering into right now by obedience to Christ. His lordship, his laws, and his culture are the stuff heaven is made of. If we accept these things, we can begin to enter into the kingdom even in this life, and we will gain it in the next life as well. But if a person rejects these things, they obviously can't enter into these things. Just as street signs and various businesses characterize the modern city, Christ's lordship, his laws, and his culture characterize heaven. So when someone asks, can I go to heaven even if I reject Christ, what I hear is, can I go to heaven even if I reject heaven? What they want is not heaven, because heaven is characterized by Christ. Once the Lordship of Christ is accepted, then quite literally, heaven is accepted. Until then, a person simply can't enter it because they are actively avoiding it. All this adds still another angle to the conversation about eternal life and eternal punishment as well. If God in Christ is eternal and we are avoiding him, we are doomed to experience eternal chastisement. We will never be free of him, so we will also never be freed from the consequences of rejecting him so long as we continue to reject him. Yet conversely, if we accept Christ, we can receive his eternal life even now, because the life we begin in him is itself eternal. Thus, so long as we reject Christ, both now or later, we will experience eternal chastisement. Yet, so long as we receive Christ, we will experience eternal life. I do not believe that we can fall in and out of heaven, but I do believe that heaven is a state of orientation as much as it is anything else. The joy we will experience will be due to the direction that we are facing. We must face Christ to get into heaven. But heaven itself is also the experience of facing Christ. The direction we choose is the direction we go in, and as Christ is infinite, our chosen direction is infinite. So heaven and hell are the manifested experiences of our internal orientation. They are real, tangible places, and not just states of mind. But they are tangible places characterized by the manifestation of the motivation that drives us into them in the first place. The Christian Universalist, then, would be in agreement with the rest of the church in affirming that there are two roads to choose from, one that leads to life and one that leads to death. Where the difference between the Universalist and the believer in unending torment arises is when we discuss the outcome of still another point that we all agree on. Namely, that no matter what path we choose, we will all find ourselves before Christ's throne. Scripture couldn't be clearer on this point either. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 32, we find Christ's well-known declaration that when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 13, we read, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And Paul says of Christ in Philippians 2, 
God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no hint, at least in any brand of Christianity that I've ever encountered, of anyone avoiding the throne of Christ. It has always been believed that everyone, without exception, will ultimately stand before Christ. The Nicene Creed even alludes to this when referring to Christ's return. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. So there are two parallel points that have been universally agreed upon since the very beginning of the Christian faith. First, that not all roads lead to heaven. But second, that no matter what road we take, we will all wind up before the throne of Christ. There is only one path of life, and that's the path of Christ. Yet even if we avoid that path, Christ remains our destination. We will all appear before him. So if we all agree on these two points, where does Christian universalism part ways with the conventional teaching of the modern church? It does so when considering the purposes of God when it comes to the second point. The Christian universalist agrees that all men will one day be gathered before Christ, but refuses to ignore the clear biblical implications of such a gathering. To flesh this out, let's dig into two texts in Scripture that highlight both the universal scope and the clear intent of God's purposes in Christ. John 12, 27 through 36, and John 6, 44. Beginning with John 12, we find that Christ has just made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and he has recognized that very soon he will be betrayed and crucified. So when a crowd of Jews and Greeks gather around him, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Obviously, it's verse 32 that has the most bearing on our subject, where Christ says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This idea of being drawn to Christ must be clearly understood. Overwhelmingly, when we see this term used in Scripture, it's used to describe a superior power exercising its will over a lesser power or person or object. In John 18, it is used to describe Peter drawing his sword before he strikes the servant of the high priest. Obviously, the sword itself didn't have the power to prevent itself from striking the high priest or from being drawn in the first place. It's also used in John 21 of the disciples drawing in their fishing nets. And again, it would be preposterous for us to attribute any power of resistance to the nets themselves. They are completely subject to the fishermen who are pulling them in. And it's used again in Acts 16, Acts 21, and James chapter 2 to describe believers being dragged into court by the authorities. In all of these cases, it's clear that the believers were unable to prevent this. They might have resisted, but the whole point of these passages is that they were forced to appear in court. The outcome of their being drawn was unavoidable. Still, the term is also used in John 6:44, where Christ says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Some commentators, such as Ellicott's Commentary for English Readers and the Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges, deny any inevitable result implied in the idea of being drawn. 
They point out, for example, that the idea of being drawn is used only in a moral sense in John 6.44 and John 12.32, and therefore does not violate or override the free will of the person being drawn. They contend that man's will is free, he can refuse to be drawn, and there is no violence, the attraction is moral. So according to some, the drawing of all men to Christ is not something that should be tied to an inevitable result. Rather, it can be resisted and thwarted by the will of man. However, there doesn't seem to be any reason to argue over the effectiveness of the drawing in this text. In these passages, just as in every other, the drawing still fully accomplishes its aim, though the aim seems to have been largely misidentified. In the case of John 6.44, notice specifically that Christ says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It doesn't actually say that no one comes unless the Father draws him. This is a very important distinction. The power of the drawing in John 6.44 results in the ability to come, not necessarily in the coming itself. Thus, no one can be saved unless they are drawn into a state in which they are granted the capacity to come to Christ. Just as Peter's sword couldn't resist striking the servant of the high priest, and the nets the disciples fished with couldn't resist being pulled in, those who are drawn cannot resist being granted the capacity for coming to Christ. They are drawn into a position of agency, but not necessarily into any particular result of it. Moreover, when Christ says, and I will raise him up on the last day, this can clearly be understood as pertaining exclusively to those who took advantage of such capacity and agency and chose Christ. We could lay things out like this. To come to Christ, we must have the ability to do so. Through the drawing power of Christ and the Father, we are granted this ability. If we take advantage of this ability to come to Christ, Christ will raise us up on the last day. When we understand the text this way, which seems to be the most appropriate way to understand it, there is no reason to limit the impact of the idea of being drawn. In every case, then, as we've stated before, it is used to describe a superior power exercising its will over a lesser power or person or object. And in this case, the superior power is granting the lesser power, that is, the individual, the capacity to choose. Yet one more point needs to be made about John 6.44 before returning to John 12. And this is that there is no limit implied in John 6 concerning those who will be drawn into a state of being able to respond to the call of Christ. In fact, the opposite is true. For in John 6, Christ goes on to explain, If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Thus we see an available action set before us the eating of the bread, which symbolizes partaking of Christ. And this bread is given not for the life of a few only, but for the life of the world. So those who are drawn cannot avoid the capacity of coming to Christ. And who has Christ targeted with the reception of this capacity? The whole world. St. Jerome confirms this in his letter to Amandus in the late 4th century. He writes, If Christ then for our sakes was made a curse, that he might deliver us from the curse of the law, are you surprised that he is also for our sakes subject to the Father to make us too subject to him? As he says in the Gospel, No man cometh unto the Father but by me, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Christ then is subject to the Father in the faithful, for all believers, nay, for the whole human race, are accounted members of his body. But in unbelievers, that is, in Jews, heathens, and heretics, he is said to be not subject, for these members of his body are not subject to the faith. So, according to Jerome, the whole human race has been impacted by Christ's work on the cross. The drawing power of the gospel is therefore universal. But returning to John 12, some will claim that the whole point of Christ's statements there about drawing all men to himself is simply to show that there is no category of men that will be excluded from his drawing power. Contextually, we've just been told that some Greeks had come to Philip and asked to see Jesus. So when Jesus proclaimed that he would draw all men to himself, 
He simply meant that he would, as a result of his crucifixion, draw men from both categories to himself, both Jews and Gentiles. In other words, through the cross, salvation would no longer be barred from anyone based on ethnic or social categories. D.A. Carson seems to take this view when he explains it this way. Here all men reminds the reader of what triggered these statements, the arrival of the Greeks, and means all people without distinction, Jews and Gentiles alike, not all individuals without exception. This is the implicit answer to the Greeks. The hour has come for him to die and be exalted, and in the wake of that passion and glorification, they will be able to approach him as freely as do the children of the Old Covenant. So according to Carson, the only thing implied when Christ says that he will draw all people is that he will draw all kinds of people, not just Jews, but Gentiles also. But it should be noted that at this stage in the text, Jesus is responding to the crowds in general, and not specifically speaking to the Greeks. Moreover, there is no reason to limit the scope of Christ's drawing power to only some Gentiles, rather than to every individual without exception. The necessity of such a limitation is based solely upon a Reformed doctrine being carried into this text by Carson and is not framed by the text itself. The term all, I would argue, should be taken in its most natural sense of including the entirety of a subject without exception, unless it is deliberately limited. So when Christ says that he will draw all people to himself, we can safely assume that he means every individual without exception. And if we do take the text this way, we are in good company, because as we have seen, this is how St. Jerome interpreted Christ's words. If we pick up where we left off in St. Jerome's letter to Amandus, he explicitly marks this universal impact of Christ's drawing power. Beginning where he quotes Christ, he says, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Christ then is subject to the Father in the faithful, for all believers, nay, the whole human race, are accounted members of his body. But in unbelievers, that is, in Jews, heathens, and heretics, he is said to be not subject, for these members of his body are not subject to the faith. But in the end of the world, when all his members shall see Christ, that is, their own body, reigning, they also shall be made subject to Christ, that is, to their own body, that the whole of Christ's body may be subject unto God and the Father, and that God may be all in all. Note specifically that Jerome identifies the whole human race as members of Christ's body, and then goes on to explain that at the end of the world, when all his members see him, again, his members including the whole human race, even unbelievers, they shall be made subject to Christ, so that God may be all in all. It's notable here that the New Testament idea of God being all in all, according to Jerome, included every person without exception. It wasn't limited to the church exclusively, but included even unbelievers. But more to the point of this video, the clear conclusion of the church fathers, and the natural conclusion to be drawn from John 12, 32, is that through the cross, Christ has decided to draw every individual person to himself. I'm not saying that every church father was a universalist, but I am saying that the church fathers believed that all men would be drawn into an inevitable, universal encounter with Christ. So up to this point, we've basically just reinforced the Christian universalists' second point of agreement with conventional scholarship. The first point we discussed was that there are only two roads to choose from, one that leads to life and one that leads to death. And the second point was that no matter which road we take, we will all appear before Christ's throne and be made subject to his authority. Because Christ was raised up on the cross, we will all be quickened with the capacity to choose our path, but regardless of our choice, we will all find ourselves face to face with Christ in the end. Thus, the scope of Christ's work is agreed upon and confirmed yet again. But here is where the Christian Universalist begins to see things differently. For while the conventional theologian will contend that man's unavoidable encounter with Christ will result in unending condemnation for billions upon billions, the Christian Universalist will contend that this encounter will ultimately result in the salvation of all mankind. Yet we Christian Universalists 
don't part ways with the conventional narrative lightly or simply because we don't like the idea of unending torment. Rather, we simply acknowledge the biblically expressed intent behind God's drawing all people to himself. This intent is clearly identified in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, it is the ability to come to Christ that is granted to men by the Father here. Yet the divine purpose in giving such an ability is absolutely clear. The Father draws men so they can come to Christ, so that in coming to Christ, they may be raised up on the last day. We don't have to read between the lines to understand this. When God draws men to himself, he does so because he wants people to respond to him and be saved. So what does this tell us about the second point of agreement we all share as believers that all men will come face to face with Christ one day? If men are drawn to Christ by God so they might respond and believe, what's the most obvious conclusion we can arrive at when we read that ultimately all men will be gathered by God to Christ? Why do we consider it such a stretch or even heresy to believe that the purposes of God and the outcomes he desires will not be thwarted. God draws people to himself to give them the capacity and the opportunity to respond to him and be saved. And we find clear indications in scripture that all men will indeed take advantage of this opportunity. Philippians 2, 9-11, which we read earlier, clearly delineates this. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul makes it clear that all men are drawn to Christ, and this drawing, as we have seen, is synonymous with being given the capacity and the opportunity to respond to Christ and be saved. And when granted this opportunity, mankind universally bows the knee to Christ and confesses that He is Lord, I would challenge anyone to point out any reference in the New Testament where a reverential act of bowing and confessing isn't an expression of genuine repentance. So wrapping up, we found that all Christians agree that there are only two paths to choose from, one that leads to life and one that leads to death. But we have also found that we all agree that regardless of our path, none of us can escape being drawn before Christ's throne. The conventional theologian will argue that this inevitable encounter with Christ will result in unending damnation for many, but the Christian universalist, frankly, just finds it difficult to see the theological consistency of such a claim. If God draws men to Christ so they might be granted the capacity and opportunity to be saved, and we see clear indications that they will take advantage of this opportunity and repent, how can we conclude anything? except that all men will ultimately be saved. The view of the church concerning the fate of the damned has never been unanimous. There have always been questions that were debated, even amongst faithful Christians that largely agreed on the subject. But I think it's time for universalism to be recognized as a legitimate Christian position again. All the misconceptions and straw man arguments that are cited against it are, at best, stale and misleading, and at worst, dishonest. Christian universalists can, with a high degree of consistency, fully acknowledge the holiness of God, embrace the call to live lives of sold-out devotion to God, and retain a passion for the mission of making disciples of all nations. We may not all see eye to eye on the issue of hell, and frankly, I'm not convinced that we need to, but I am convinced that we ought to build one another up in love, that we ought to point people to Jesus that we ought to pursue his kingdom with every ounce of energy that we have, and that the church needs to stop marginalizing those who, on the basis of scripture and history and reason, harbor a hope for the damned. Thanks again for your support and your encouragement as the channel reaches the one-year mark. As I said at the beginning of the video, I'm eager to engage more with your thoughts and questions over the coming year. So please send me an email using the address provided in the video description and let me know what topics or questions you'd like to hear about. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the video if you liked it. And thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel.